So I thought that this would be an interesting topic because I've always wondered where this came from, where it originated from. When I was a kid, I used to watch gangster movies and I'd always wonder why they would open a brand new bottle of liquor and pour out some onto the ground. Now, me being a kid, I thought it was wasteful and stupid. Now, I obviously knew that it was in remembrance of friends that had passed away, but it didn't stop there. I remember my late grandfather used to watch old country western movies. That's all he would watch all day long. There was a channel that played nothing but old country western cowboy movies, and that's what he kept his TV on. And I remember sitting on the couch one day watching with him. He had fallen asleep. <laughs> but I remember in this particular movie, the cowboy in the movie did the same thing. He poured out his drink in honor of his friend. So I realized at that moment that this pouring out the water or liquor ritual had been carried throughout the centuries, different generations adding twists to it, but pretty much the same principle. Now, in my estimation, and I'm probably wrong about this, King David was the first man to be recorded doing this. And it happens in two places in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 23, 16 and 1 Chronicles 11, 18. The accounting in 1 Chronicles is the same as 2 Samuel. It's just recorded in two different books. So what does King David do? Let me paint a picture for you. So King David and his men are at war with the Philistines, not just at war, but we're overcoming the Philistines in a great way. So much so that when their, this accounting took place, David and his men were in the garrison of the Philistines. So they were right at their front door. We need to remember that at this time in David's life, he was an old man, okay? He wasn't the same young warrior that he was in 1 Samuel. So because of this, he got his top of the top choice warriors with him. These men were, you know, top of the top, and they had earned their spots in David's army, and they did so by killing big name warriors. And it speaks about this earlier in chapter 11 of 1 Chronicles. So David and his men have advanced into the garrison of his enemy's front line, and David is tired and he's thirsty. So what does he do? 1 Chronicles eleven seventeen 17 says, and, De and David said with longing, oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem. So three of David's top captains broke out running deeper into the Philistine stronghold killing men as they advanced, and came to a well of water. They drew some water and brought it back to David. Now, this is the interesting point, and this is what separates what David did from what the gang members and the cowboys did. Pay attention here. First Chronicles eleven eighteen b Nevertheless, David would not drink the water, but poured it out to the Lord. He didn't drink any of it. We just read how David was tired and wearisome. He was thirsty, but instead of drinking it, he poured it out to honor the Lord. In many ways, it was a fast. David denied himself unto the Lord because of the victory that God had brought them. Whenever I see the gang members or cowboys pour out their drink, they always drink it after, but David didn't. So this was a somewhat of an interesting topic to take or an interesting take on pouring out liquor and water. And my hope is that the next time you see someone do this, if you ever do, that you think of David and why he did it. You know, it's amazing. I remember at seminary, all the Korean students, and I befriended one of them and I said, well, you know, why aren't the Korean students, why don't you hang around with anybody? And they never would answer me. And finally I asked one of them, I said, well, come on, I pushed him in a corner. He says, all right, if you want to know, we don't hang around with you Americans because we don't want to be carnal like you. I mean, this isn't necessarily... But, I mean, some, sometimes in some of those churches, they, they have to fast 40 days to be a deacon. I'm not saying that that's what we should be doing, but I'm saying, folks, there's a whole bunch of Christianity out there that isn't American instantaneous Christianity. It has to do with knowing God. Fasting is, is another thing. When do you fast, people ask me. When, when do you fast? Well, let me tell you something about fasting. This maybe will help you because this really helped me. Because I, I got into the thing of I need to fast so many days or I need to fast weeks or I need to do this and I need to reach... This is what I discovered. Most of what I did was wrong. It was just turned out to be a gruesome endurance test. <laughs> But here's what I've discovered. All right, I don't get to do it anymore because I don't have time. Just don't have time. But let's say that for four years I've been planning on going on an elk hunt. Okay, and it's just that's all I've thought about: planning the elk hunt, getting the right bow, practicing, just thinking about the elk hunt. Man, it's just my passion. Okay, and then right the day. I'm leaving. I got the truck all loaded up. Everything's in there. Man, I'm going once in a lifetime. I've waited for this. Man, it's all I can think about. I get ready to get in my car. And my little six-year-old Ian, he goes, my head, my head. And he falls to the ground. At that moment, do you honestly think I'm going to go, 
dang, I've been waiting four years to go on this elk hunt, and now this has to happen. Do you honestly think that's what's going to happen if I'm a decent man? You know what's going to happen? I'll tell you what's going to happen. That elk hunt has totally disappeared from my mind. It doesn't even exist. And if someone were to say, you really need to go on that elk hunt, I would think that that was the most atrocious thing someone could ever suggest. One passion has been totally replaced by another. And for me, that's what fasting is. When there's a person who I feel like is in spiritual problems, or there's a sin in my own life I can't seem to get victory in, or there's something that needs to happen on the mission field that I feel like is being there's an obstacle to there, or there's something going on, and it begins. It's not about I ought to fast because then maybe God will do something, but it's about don't even mention to me food until this thing is resolved. Do you see? It's not a quiet time. Let me just share with you something. I hate quiet times. Because quiet times to me are like putting my wife in a closet 24 hours a day and pulling her out at 7 o'clock in the morning to meet with her for 20 minutes. And then putting her back in the closet and say, check that off, I did my quiet time. I think we ought to have times with God and we ought to read the Word. And It's good to have times that are specific. But don't reduce your Christian life to a quiet time. Don't reduce your communion with God down to something you can check off. You had your quiet time, so everything is fine. 